It's wonderful to have you join us for our NIH Wednesday afternoon lecture. Congratulations to all of you who figured out that this is at two o'clock instead of our usual three o'clock. And apologies to the people who sign on an hour from now and wonder what happened here. We tried to get the word out as much as we possibly could. And it looks like we have a great turnout. And I understand why, because I think we have a terrific speaker that you're going to learn a lot from in terms of what he has been able to do and lead through his team in terms of the development of very special kinds of uh, interventions uh, for people with leg disabilities caused by amputation, stroke, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, providing all kinds of assistive technologies uh, that include bionic limb electromechanics and control. Hugh Herr, who is our speaker, is currently a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the program in Media Arts and Sciences and Health Sciences and Technology. Um, he uh, got his undergraduate degree at Millersville University, a master's in mechanical engineering from MIT, a PhD in biophysics at Harvard, and then went on in the faculty arena to be appointed both at Harvard and MIT. Not too many people have been able to do that and survived. Uh, and then went on from there uh, to join MIT's program, uh, where he has been uh, since 2004, uh, working through the various ranks to now being a full professor. His inventions have attracted a lot of attention. I've had the pleasure of seeing him and hearing some of his presentations at the World Economic Forum. Uh, he's won a variety of awards uh, for these inventions and technologies. And he has a particular personal reason uh, for being very knowledgeable and motivated about this particular area, because as a teenager, very involved in, in mountain climbing, uh, ended up in a circumstance where after severe frostbite, uh, had amputation below the knee of both legs. So a lot of what he has been working on, he's tried out first on himself. So a dramatic uh, contributor uh, to advances in biomedicine, uh, somebody that I think you will learn a lot from and get inspired at the way in which physical sciences and biological sciences come together in the science of tissue synthetic interface and the design of bionic limbs. Uh, glad to welcome to our virtual stage, uh, Professor Hugh Herr of MIT. Hugh, welcome, really glad you're with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the, the emerging field of bionics. As, as stated in the gracious introduction, uh, my laboratory at MIT focuses on, on limb bionics and creating human-machine interactions which um, augment uh, physical capability. So how did I get into this business of bionics? Uh, as was stated in the introduction, I uh, lost both of my legs, biological legs, to frostbite in a mountain climbing accident in 1982. Um, after the accident, I dreamed of climbing again. Climbing was my life's passion. And the, the question was, how might this be possible? So I actually went into the uh, machine shop um, and started building my own legs. And I quickly realized that I had uh, an opportunity because both of my legs were amputated. For example, I could adjust my height. So here I'm um, well over three meters tall, able to reach all kinds of hand and footholds. Um, so what I did is I eventually developed a whole plethora of, of prostheses, um, some that would enable me to stand on small rock edges, the width of a coin. Others allowed me to climb thin rock fissures where the human foot cannot penetrate. Still others allowed me to climb steep ice vertical walls. So through all this, I was able to climb at a more advanced level than I had achieved before the accident with regular biological limbs, um, which was a tremendous lesson for me because I, I realized that technology has the power to, to heal and to rehabilitate, and in my own case, actually extend beyond um, normal physiological levels. Uh, so here are my legs today. Um, these legs are called the Empowers. They're the only uh, computer controlled and robotic powered prostheses uh, commercially available. We fit a, a approximately 3,000 people with these devices, um, many of which have been uh, soldiers that have lost limbs uh, in defending the country. 
Um, today, I'm going to talk primarily about how to attach such devices that are computer controlled directly to the skeleton and directly to the peripheral nervous system so that they really become an integral part of, of human physiology. Uh, today, I, um, I direct the Center for Extreme Bionics at MIT. Um, it involves a number of faculty, Ed Boyden and Bob Langer and others. And we're really taking a, a broad um, interdisciplinary approach to the problem of how to augment human physicality as well as uh, cognition and sensory experience. So this work falls under um, the center that I'll be addressing today. So what, what is Bionics? So I, I often describe Bionics as this glorious interplay between uh, biology and, and engineering design. This is a double-sided uh, double arrow. So often Bionics, we, we gain a deeper understanding of how humans work. And that deeper scientific understanding informs the engineering design of, for example, a biomimetic exoskeleton or a prosthesis. But this arrow is double-sided because sometimes engineering design informs biology. Sometimes design creates new biology in areas of synthetic biology, regenerative medicine, um, as well as surgical techniques as well. So Bionics, again, um, what we explore is this very fun interdisciplinary activities between biological science and um, physical design and engineering. And one area that I'd like to chat about today is what I call neuro-embodied design. So it, typically a designer of a device that attaches to the human body uh, primarily focuses on the design of that device. In neural and body design, we relax that constraint and we say, how can we co-develop, co-design the biological body with the synthetic construct to maximize communication between the device and the human being bidirectionally, both mechanically and neurally? So that's, that's primarily the, the area of design for which I will focus upon today. Um, and because of the limitation in time, I'm going to primarily focus on our work in the area of, of amputation. So here again is the Empower uh, powered prosthesis. It, it comprises a muscle tendon-like actuator, uh, three microprocessors, about 12 sensors. It's a purely intrinsic device, however. Um, all the tech and all the algorithms are local to the device. It does not talk to the nervous system. And, you know, of course, as practitioners in our field, we can advance more sophisticated and better and better intrinsic controllers. Um, it's just a matter of time where we can use machine learning and robotics and so on to have a prosthesis that enables all kinds of gait, such as going up steps, um, satisfying biological um, biomechanics and going down as well. But the problem with this purely intrinsic approach is the human's not really in the loop. So the, the, a little bit of a story. I, I walked on our first powered ankle foot prosthesis in 2002 in the laboratory at MIT. And it was very exciting because I had not felt that calf muscle plantar flexion as I walked um, since my amputations in 1982. And when I felt that robotic assist, it was truly um, a wonderful feeling. But it felt like my bionic limbs were walking me. It, it didn't feel like I, I was walking. It felt like I was the backseat driver in a very powerful car. So what we wanna do is link the nervous system directly to the, to the electromechanics and have a person be able to think and actually move and affect the synthetic motors and actually have sensors on the synthetic device um, inputted into the nervous system to give the, the human the sense of, of touch, of proprioception of that synthetic limb so that they're better able to control it through uh, nerve uh, efferent signaling. So that's that's the goal. And by doing that, we, we believe we can 
achieve an embodiment where the human user has uh, feels embodiment over the device. So there's been tremendous progress over the decades in developing um, robotics, you know, artificial actuators, sensors, small computational elements, better materials, and so on. There's been less innovation in the area of surgical design and how limbs are amputated. So as an example, on the, on the left, you see a textbook from 1860 on how a limb should be amputated below the knee. And a modern textbook on the right by Netter, 2016, largely teaching the same technique on how a limb should be amputated below the knee. Uh, so after all that time, we're still teaching the same uh, clinical practices, That's, that doesn't seem right. Um, so um, what we're trying to capture in our work is, is to create um, a model for proprioception afferent feedback. So what is muscle tendon proprioception? So this quick animation. We see the musculature that spans the ankle joint and the biological anatomy and flexion extension of the ankle joint um, you, muscles are filled with biological sensors that measure the length and speed and force of those muscles. And that's communicated to the brain and gives us a sense of proprioception, where our limbs are in space. And there's a growing body of evidence that muscle tendinous proprioception, our sense of the muscle length, speed, and force is really important to how we move. So this is a four dynamic model of human bipedal gait uh, advanced by Hartmut Geyer and myself uh, many years ago. And this model only relies on muscle tendon type proprioception from its modeled muscles. And what emerges in this model is an incredible adaptation across terrain. So this, this simulation has no model of the undulating underlying terrain, the steps and the slopes and whatnot. But as an emergent response, it adapts to these, this variable train activity through these very powerful, primarily in the spinal cord circuits that rely on a sensing of muscle length, speed, and force. So what's, what's the problem with today's amputation strategy, the standard clinical practice? Well, here's an animation that describes it. So muscles are attached largely isometrically with a mydesis technique disrupting the agonist antagonist muscle dynamic interaction, disrupting the wealth of biological sensory information that is sent to the CNS, informing the human about this, the spatial location of their limb. So unfortunately, my legs were amputated as I stated earlier in 1982, and I received this Civil War era amputation where my muscles were tacked down largely in an isometric manner. I feel my feet as a phantom awareness, but that it feels as though my feet are in rigid ski boots. I can't feel them moving. Um, not surprising because my muscles and my residuum are tacked down at constant length and they can't move dynamically. Therefore, they can't um, release sensory information to my brain about where, um, where my phantom limb is in space. So there's an opportunity here to link um, three areas of science and technology. One is peripheral reconstruction and regenerative medicine um, with muscle sensing and stimulation, and thirdly, with neuromechanical control. If we bring these areas together and integrate them, I think we can make tremendous progress in neural interfacing. So uh, in 2014, I believe it was, my MIT group invented what we call the agonist antagonist mild neural interface, or AMI for short. Um, so what is an AMI? An AMI is, comprises two muscles that are surgically linked in, in a linear fashion in series um, inside the amputated residuum. When the agonist contracts due to electrical activation, either from the CNS or through artificial electrical stimulation, it, it, um, that action, that contraction stretches the antagonist muscle. 
And then these muscle dynamics then are communicated to the CNS do, via uh, biological sensing of spindle fibers and Golgi tendon organs, giving the person the sense of muscle length and speed and force. So the idea here of the Amy is when ant limbs are amputated to create one muscle pair or one Amy to control each external prosthetic degree of freedom. So here you see an above knee amputee and one Amy highlighted. So that Amy could control the knee, the robotic knee, and then a, a second and a third could control the ankle and the subtalar joint, just as an example. So when the person thinks after amputation and moves their phantom appendage, these muscle constructs would then move dynamically given the CNS a rich um, uh, biological sensory volume of the position, speed, and load on those constructs. If we link using artificial sensors, the, the output of these muscle uh, tendon units uh, to the control of the robot, we can essentially uh, uh, have better control of the external prosthesis, as well as providing the human a proprioceptive feedback from the prosthesis. There are two types of Amy. Um, one is a regenerative Amy, and a, the second is a, a native Amy. So a regenerative Amy um, is built by taking two muscle grafts that do not have nerves or vascularization and um, putting them in close contact or vicinity to a transected nerve. Um, one nerve, say, you, once prior to the amputation, say, flexed a joint, and another nerve before amputation extended a joint, for example, the, the nerve then regenerates and innervates the muscle grafts and the body vascularizes these small muscle slivers. We then surgically attach them mechanically so that when the agonist contracts, it stretches the antagonist and vice versa. So that's a regenerative Amy where we build up the muscle pair um, fundamentally um, and recreate a sense an agonist antagonist muscle pair um, neurally and, and mechanically. The other type of Amy is called a native Amy, where of course, when a limb is amputated, there's native musculature and the native Amy simply um, attaches or connects agonist antagonist pairs in natural ways um, to create these uh, output uh, signals for the prosthesis. So uh, moving on, of course, before our human work, we did preclinical work in, in rat and larger animal models. So one of our first experiments with a rat animal model is shown here, where we transected the EDL muscle and, and we flipped it 180 degrees. So there's a passive tendon connecting the muscle grafts for electrical iso isolation. We then took the transected perineal and tibial nerves and put them in uh, close proximity to these muscle grafts. In, in a few months, the nerves regenerated attached to these muscle grafts. Our fear in this experiment is that it wouldn't work because the body would simply scar down and not allow natural movements, but that didn't happen. So here you see in the plot on the right, average percent strain versus stimulation amplitude, where we get physiological levels of muscle strain as these agonist antagonist pairs are being cycled after innervation. Moving the next uh, slide. So here you see the EMG plotted versus time. The circle you see shows um, the contraction of the agonist muscle through electrical stimulation, artificial stimulation, and then a, uh, a commensurate stretch of the antagonist muscle pair so every time the agonist is fired, it stretches the antagonist. What's plotted here is the nerve signal of the antagonist muscle. So what you see here is the electronographic signal of showing afferent signaling to the brain of the animal. And what you see on the right is as the level of stimulation increases in the agonist, the amount of afferent signaling uh, up to the spinal cord in the brain in the animal also increases. So essentially we can show here in our paper in Science Robotics that we can create a muscle uh, pair um, 
in terms of electrophysiology and biomechanics. Um, we can also build native amies. Here's a preclinical experiment where we, where we um, isolated and disinserted the gastroxoleus complex and linked it to the TA. And then in experiments, once again, we can see that as the antagonist is stretched more and more due to agonist activation, we get our ever increasing ENG level um, as if it's uh, intact physiology. So after all this preclinical work, we felt confident to transition to a, a actual human subject. This is Jim Ewing. Um, we, Jim and I have known each other for 30 some years. Um, we climbed together as teenagers in New Hampshire. Um, Jim was in a, in a very terrible mountain climbing accident. He fell uh, when he was uh, about 50, 60 feet off, off the ground and he fell, his rope failed to catch him and he hit a very rocky ground surface. He broke many bones in his bottle, body. He punctured his lungs. One leg in particular had uh, a distinct pathology where and after many surgeries and rehabilitation, it still hurt to take every single step in a walking gait as he was limping along. And Jim came to me in tears and he said, I, I just can't live this way. Um, I'm in so much pain every single day. Um, I'm thinking about whether amputation makes sense of my um, deeply affected leg. His timing was perfect because we had just invented this Amy procedure and we had just gone through years of preclinical work. And turns out Jim was the first uh, uh, human patient to undergo the procedure. Here's an animation of the surgery that was done on Jim's leg on the transtibial below knee level. This was conducted at Brigham Women's Hospital here in Boston, um, led by Dr. Cardi, a, a fantastic plastic surgeon and a key collaborator in the Amy project. So um, what was done is, uh, of course, the, the, the bone was um, transected below the knee. But uh, tar tarsal tunnels were harvested distally and repositioned on the tibia. And they, they were uh, reused as guides, kind of linear bearings for the tendons of two Amy constructs. Our hypothesis is that after the surgery, our uh, Jim would be able to think and move his phantom limb and actually feel those movements as a phantom dynamic uh, response. And, and if we were to attach a robotic prosthesis to him, he'd actually be able to feel the movement of the bionic appendage. So here's, here's what was actually done. We created two amies, an ankle amy, which was built by connecting the tibialis anterior to the lateral gastrocnemius via the tarsal tunnel pulley. And then a second amy for subtalar prosthetic control comprising the perineus longus to the tibialis posterior, again, through its own tarsal tunnel. So again, after, after the surgery, we were very um, concerned that the body would scar up and um, restrict these dynamic agnus and agnus movements, but that did not happen. So here's an ultrasound image of the lateral gastroc coupled to the TA showing um, substantial fascicle strains um, as the phantom uh, ankle is being moved by the patient. So here are uh, EMG measures. These black box, uh, block boxes are measuring the electromyographic signals from the amy muscles. Jim is moving his unaffected leg to show us how he's moving his phantom limb. And what I wanna point out here is how distinct the electromyographic signals are from the four amy muscles. It's very easy. Uh, you don't need a, a complex machine learning algorithms to understand these patterns. There's very little co-contraction as one would typically see with a standard amputation. We then uh, built a robot and a very basic controller um, that has inputs from all the EMG signals from the amy muscles. And, a, and then that produces a desired torque uh, that then the robotic controller closes the loop on. So here's Jim um, mirroring his affected side, of course. There's plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, 
and then about the subtalar joint eversion and inversion. So we thought this was fantastic because in our previous experiments with persons with conventional amputations, they're not able to control two degrees of freedom at the same time. And it turns out for free space control, um, as we published in our paper in Science Translational Medicine in 2018, um, you see tremendous improvements in control that uh, our patient Jim exhibits compared to a set of traditional persons with traditional amputations. So in this experiment, there's a visual display and a two-dimensional space showing one axis uh, inversion eversion about the subtalar joint and a second axis plantar dorsiflexion. And then a person's commanded to move the cursor into different regions in that two-dimensional space. And we look at various control messages like the wasted movements to get to the positional target, how, how long a person can, can hold the target, how much impedance control they have while maintaining that positional target and so on. Plotted in the right is just one of these me metrics, wasted motion. And the, the, the group with traditional amputations you see has a tremendous amount of wasted motion in distinction to our, our single subject with uh, the Amy amputation. So that was interesting, but then Jim stood up and before our eyes, we saw something truly remarkable that really natural biomechanics uh, were mediated through the electromechanics as he walked up and down steps and slopes. Um, so all these movements that you see are not uh, um, volitional movements from Jim. He's not consciously trying to make these movements. They're involuntary. So here, for example, he's walking down steps and you see on the bionic side, he's reaching his bionic toe to the next stair tread for shock attenuation, as is what happens in an intact biological limb. So we think because Jim's brain, CNS, is receiving um, a richer volume of muscle tendons proprioception, his efferent descending signals are more informed and more organized and really reflecting the circuits in the spinal cord and these involuntary actions that occur with our legs as we walk across terrain. So here's some pilot data. Again, this is in a paper in Science Translational Medicine 2018. Here, our subject, Jim, walked up steps. And what an intact ankle typically does is dorsiflex in late swing phase, as shown in the box. And that's exactly what the affected side uh, did in Jim's case. But the four control subjects in terminal swing did not have that behavior at all. So typically when a person with an intact limb goes up steps, again, the ankle dorsiflexes, meaning that the toes are moved closer to the ceiling for, for foot clearance and whatnot across the stair tread in the swing phase. What the control group did with traditional amputations is exactly the opposite. The ankle plantar flex, which is pointing the toes downwards um, by about seven degrees. When Jim went down the steps, Again, the robot exhibited natural behaviors. In the intact limb, the, the biological limb plantar flexes or the toes are moved down um, to achieve shock attenuation. And that's exactly what the robot did attached to Jim's nervous system. But the four control subjects um, did not move, the robot did not move in a natural way. Um, it basically hovered around zero. Uh, degrees or 90 degrees with little to no plantar flexion. Um, we also hypothesized that we could close the loop between the robot and these Amy constructs. So here we feed back measured joint torque from the robot. Then we apply functional electrical stimulation to one of the Amy muscles to control the adjacent or partner Amy muscle, uh, its force uh, or position. Um, thinking that we could actually close the loop between the prosthesis and the nervous system in, with a torque control. In this initial pilot study, we, we tested this capability. So in this experiment, there's a pedal that's spring-loaded, um, and then the robot, as it's plane plantar flexed about the robotic ankle, compresses the pedal. 
with the patient blindfolded, we ask the patient to um, compress the pedal at four different levels, 25%, 50, 75, and fully compressed. And what we found is that when we turn the feedback on, when we inputted information, torque information from the robot into the Amy construct, that the, our patient was able to very easily um, target different levels of uh, uh, pedal uh, compression or torque. And when we turned the feedback off, they were, the subject was not able to output distinct torque levels. So this is a first example of force feedback into the nervous system from a prosthesis. So today, after that N equal one, uh, we've now done many subjects with the Amy amputation and broader studies across a larger N. Um, recently, we have a paper in the proceedings of, of the National Academy of Sciences that just came out about a month ago on N equal 12 subjects with the Amy amputation, comparing them to match controls with traditional amputation. The key findings of this paper is we found greater control of residual limb musculature with the Amy population, increased phantom limb percepts, greater phantom limb range of motion, and reduced pain. So we're rapidly um, scaling this new intervention across uh, a greater and greater uh, number of patients. Um, what other technologies are required to really broaden this neural interface approach. Um, I list four here and I'll go through each of the four. Um, so the first thing that we need to move to really have a, a remarkably comprehensive and compelling interface between the residuum and a prosthesis, we need a very good artificial sensing of muscle length, speed, and force. If you will, a synthetic uh, muscle tendinous proprioceptive sensors. Um, why? Because the, all the experiments that I showed you thus far, we use surface electrodes to measure the electrical depolarization of the muscle, EMG, and that signal is, is very, um, uh, very, very poor. Um, the electrodes can be uncomfortable as well. So we need a higher fidelity uh, method of really sensing the dynamics of these muscle uh, tendon pairs. The second thing we need is a, a very high fidelity closed loop functional stimulation of muscle, because we wanna, again, apply a direct feedback signal from the prosthesis and control the state and force uh, borne by uh, one Amy muscle applied to, uh, by the other muscle that's being controlled in a feedback loop. Thirdly, we need a transcutaneous mechanoelectrical transmission uh, to, in order to effectively stimulate muscles artificially, we should have electrodes or optical outputs inside the body. And fourthly, we need a model not only for proprioceptive feedback, but also for cutaneous feedback, providing the, the, our patients uh, a sense of touch. So I'm going to go through each of these four areas and give you a sense of, of where we're moving in the future. The first is called magnetomicrometry. So here, we, um, the idea is to implant small magnetic beads into each muscle, and then with external uh, magnetometer electronics, track the, uh, the position of these beads or the contraction state of, of the muscles. So here you see a benchtop apparatus. Um, and what you see here in, in red chips is an array of magnetometer boards that measure the magnetic field um, across the various chips. And then a person holding two small magnetic spheres. So what we can do is actually um, with sophisticated algorithms, we can track the XYZ location of spheres in three-dimensional space, and we can do so very rapidly, and we can also compensate for disturbances in the magnetic field due to, for example, a large metal object or the Earth's magnetic field. So magnetic tracking is not new. Um, our innovation here is largely latency. So we have an algorithm that's very, very fast where we can track not only one magnet and tissue, but also several magnets. So for example, five degrees of freedom is two magnets being tracked. We can track that 
in, in a, just a few millisecond delay. Um, uh, fast enough where we can actually uh, apply this technology in a feedback loop to directly control from the Amy muscles um, the, uh, the prosthesis. In a preclinical experiment shown here, um, we show that we can track muscle displacements at high accuracy and precision. So in this experiment, uh, we implant the magnetic spheres into uh, an animal's muscle here, a turkey. Uh, we, we implant two muscle, two spheres, excuse me, and then we compute the distance between the spheres. Hence, the technique is called magnetomicrometry. Um, we then use an external motor to actively move the joint, which causes an oscillatory uh, movement, uh, contraction and stretching of the muscle. And then for ground truth, we use um, fluoro to track the position of these magnets and compare that to our magnet magnetomicrometry technique. So shown on the right is the distance between the magnets plotted in the vertical direction versus time. The blue curve is from magnetomicrometry and the, green, the orange is fluoro and the difference between them is shown in green. So we find a submillimeter accuracy and a precision of about 50 microns with this technique. So here's an animation of, of what we want to achieve in our first in human clinical trial. So here's an individual with an ablonee amputation. Um, you see the uh, two Amy muscles and then we, we intend to implant the magnetic beads into each muscle. And then on the socket, we attach the magneto boards, the array that we use to track um, the movement of, of the muscles. So by, by a high precision, high accuracy measurement of length and speed, we can then output that to the uh, robotic controller and have a high fidelity control. We also wanna apply this to the upper extremity. So for example, in a transradial amputation, um, we can put these magnets into the various muscles of the form, uh, created in Amy pairs, and then have a model for efferent and afferent control. Um, how, do we, how can we close the loop on Amy muscles in terms of uh, artificially stimulating muscle in a closed, uh, closed loop manner? So in the lab, we're exploring optogenetics. Here, we inject a muscle for which we want to control with a virus and what's delivered is an opsin, a light sensitive opsin. Um, here, uh, this is an animal model where we have a significant expression of the light sensitive opsin in the nerves that innervate the muscle extensor and flexor of the ankle joint. And by moving a light source uh, over uh, these nerves, there's enough depolarization of the muscle where we can control uh, the movement of the joint. What we want to do is close the loop on this optical signal um, with our magnet tracking system that tells us the length and speed of the muscles. Um, so the idea here is to plant in each muscle with small magnetic spheres and then apply a control system uh, to close the loop and modulate very carefully the optical output to do a position control on the, on the muscle tendons uh, or a force control, for example. So here's, for example, a step function in the joint uh, by closing the loop between the, the magnets and the optical output. Um, here is an example of an oscillatory target, position target uh, using functional optical stimulation versus um, uh, an FES functional electrical stimulation. Uh, in, this in this experiment with FOS using optogenetics, we're shown that we can track this oscillatory position target for a very long time without muscle fatigue. In distinction with FES, the muscle quickly fatigues um, because of the lack of uh, natural recruitment um, that you see with FOS. So we think with these techniques, we can ultimately apply them in humans and close the loop on the Amy muscles to feedback position or force into the nervous system from the prosthesis. Another technology we need is osseointegration integration because we need those optical cuffs and emitters to be implanted inside the body. So we need to be able to, uh, at a, in a high bit fashion, run wires through an implant uh, transcutaneously. 
So with this device called EOPRA, there's a titanium shaft that goes through the skin membrane into bone. The, the titanium is hollow and the surgeons can actually drill a hole in the bone and run wires from various cuffs and electrodes through the implant to the outside external prosthesis. So we, we have clinical trials underway now funded by, by DARPA and by the Army to look at this technique where we combine osseointegration and transcutaneous wiring with the Amy soft tissue constructs. Um, we, uh, we're doing N equal two patients above the knee and we're gearing up to do N equal two patients below the knee. Um, here's our first uh, above knee patient controlling an ankle joint, robotic ankle joint via wiring through the titanium shaft. Um, very, very exciting this direct mechanical neural connection. Um, one last uh, thing is cutaneous. So the, the Amy construct focuses on efferent control and proprioceptive feedback. We wanna extend that platform to also include cutaneous feedback. So the, this is a new technique um, called cu a cutaneous mechanoneural interface or CMI. Here, what we do is we take a cutaneous nerve and we take a, a patch of skin and that cutaneous nerve then uh, regenerates and attaches to the skin cells. We then wrap the, uh, the skin cells with a muscle actuator, a biological actuator. Then using electrodes, either FES or FOS, we then close the loop on that muscle actuator and apply um, sustained controllable uh, forces and strains that are applied to this uh, skin cells, the cutaneous cells, so that the person can experience natural cutaneous sensation. So for example, in this image, imagine touching the first digit or the thumb, prosthetic pressure sensors would detect that, and then that would be converted to a FES or FOS stimulation of the muscle actuator that applies strains to the skin cells um, targeted to that first digit, allowing the person to have natural cutaneous percepts. So in, in a preclinical study, we've, we recently um, published data in Nature Biomedical Engineering on this technique. So in plot A, we have the muscle um, wrapped around the skin flap, but instead of using the muscle, we, we use an indenter to mechanically indent the, uh, the skin cells that have been re by a transected nerve. So the red is the control, it's a native um, uh, cutaneous nerve to native skin. And then the CMI is shown in purple um, where we mechanically indent and we see qualitatively very similar behavior. And then on the right in plot B, we close the loop and we apply a functional electrical stimulation control of the muscle actuator. Uh, applying strains on the patch of skin to modulate directly the cutaneous uh, feedback in a mechano uh, neural transduction manner. And in C, you see uh, the rectified and afferent signaling and uh, versus the muscle actuation uh, uh, that's applying those skin strains and creating the afferents. So we hope to apply this for in a human model very, very uh, soon, which is exciting. Um, so here's the control diagram of what we seek ultimately. So you have the prosthesis on the right um, and the CNS on the left. So the CNS has descending signals or efferents that are firing the muscles of the Amy and the residuum. Then the magnets are tracking those, the length, speed and force of those muscle constructs. That goes through a biophysical controller that maps from the linear space of the muscle tendons of the Amy to the rotary space of the prosthesis, kind of in a master-slave control. We then feed back the joint position, impedances, and torques from the robot through the biophysical models, and we stimulate um, the Amy muscles to apply uh, positions and forces uh, on the muscle of interest. We also stimulate the muscle grafts wrapped around the cutaneous structures to, for a cutaneous afferent signaling. 
So um, this is uh, the broad closing the loop between the CNS and the prosthesis that we seek in the next uh, several years. So I'd like to finish up with a, a final section on neurological embodiment. Um, so the goal again is to link the nervous system to uh, synthetic computation bidirectionally. So a person can think and affect the synthetic computation and the motors and the prosthesis, as well as feel uh, sensory afferents from that prosthesis. In our preliminary data, we, we found that this seems to have a profound effect on the person's, uh, how they view the wearable robot. They see things like the robot became part of me, that it's integral to the physiology. Here's a testimony from- Really, a literally within minutes of having it all connected, it starts becoming part of me. And the, our patients do very interesting things. So one day in lab, one of our patients that received the AME amputation accidentally stepped on a roll of electrical tape and it got stuck to his robotic sneaker. Instead of reaching down awkwardly to remove the tape, he did something completely natural. He shook it off through a direct neural connection to his prosthesis. And then after the session, uh, we were just having a general discussion, a chit chat with our, with our participant. And he began gesturing with his prosthesis, you know, talking about his family and his work life and so on. He just naturally gestured through the robotic limb. You don't see this when uh, you have a limb that doesn't have bi-directional efferent afferent control. And you don't, the patients don't say things like, I have my leg back. It's more, the relationship is more tool-like and less like a neurological embodiment. We recently have a paper that came out in Science Translational Medicine that gets at why this might be. So individuals with a traditional amputation, we demonstrate a significant decrease in proprioceptive activity measured by activation of the Brodmann area 3A, the proprioceptive uh, region of the central brain, whereas uh, functional activation of the individuals with the AMIs was not significantly different from controls with no amputation. So we're trying to get at the heart of, of why this neurological embodiment is occurring uh, so that we can reproduce it and even expand it. So I'll finish up with a fun story. This is Jim again after his accident. Um, Jim wanted to climb again, just like me. So we built him a, a climbing bionic prosthesis that was linked directly to his Amy muscles. He returned to the Cayman Islands, the site where his accident occurred, and he returned to climbing again triumphantly with this new bionic appendage linked to the Amy muscles. Um, we use drones and whatnot to capture his triumphant return to climbing. And I'd like to show you, share that with you now. Thank you so much, Dr. Herr. That last video, I'm still trying to recover. I can, you know, I can't even watch it without anxiety. It's just incredible. So we're going to take a few questions if we have questions coming through the chat. But, you know, I'm a researcher who studies children with cerebral palsy. And to me, you know, the, what I really hate to see is children that feel depressed about having a disability. And I think that you just give so much hope. So I'd like you to speak to that a little bit about your view on sort of and I, what you've done to transform the reviews of disability. Yeah, I'll speak to my personal experience. You know, before my accident, as I stated, I was an extreme athlete. I was climbing walls uh, as a teenager that no one else could climb. And then my accident occurred and and suddenly I was treated by society in a very different way. I was no longer treated as powerful, 
and strong. I was treated as a weak and a cripple. And I was like, you know, I'm the same person. Why are you treating me this way? And, you know, I, it's, it's my view that, that human beings aren't broken. They're not weak. They're not disabled. The technology is weak and disabled and broken. The focus has to be as a society to always strive for better and better rehabilitation and assisted technology interventions with the long-term goal of, of really dramatically mitigating or even eliminating disability. Uh, to provide people the freedom of movement, the freedom of sensory experience, the freedom to live, for example, without severe depression. Um, we live in a world today where we can't give these people uh, with these types of um, uh, diverse uh, conditions the freedoms that they seek. So I, my, my hope is and my life's mission is to really try to move the needle in one area of rehabilitation and provide people with with uh, freedoms that they don't currently have. Yeah, we talk a lot about equity and diversity and, and things like that. And this technology can really transform a lot of that, which is incredible. So first question, have you done much with geriatrics? There are advances in Japan um, of devices that can help the elderly walk and- Yeah, move. great question, thank you. Um, I didn't have time to, today to talk about our exoskeletal work. Um, but we, we now have a leg exoskeleton that's in the process of uh, commercialization. The, the, the device um, is a foot ankle device. It's motorized. It's essentially a synthetic robotic calf muscle. Um, uh, the, one of the leading uh, reasons why persons of age can't move around comfortably bipedally is knee osteoarthritis. And it's believed that a causal um, reason for joint degradation is uh, a loss of fast twitch muscle fiber in the calf muscle and power, which causes a tremendous amount of muscle skeletal stress in the leading leg when a person walks. With exoskeletons, we can, uh, we can put 18 year old calf muscles, robotic calf muscles on everyone independent of their age. And I think tremendously impact the capacity of persons with age to walk comfortably um, without so much pain and discomfort. I'm getting older, that sounds really good to me. Um, next question is, is back to the amputations and you, you probably get these questions a lot about what will it take for these procedures, these surgical procedures to become, be validated, licensed, scaled up so that more and more people are using them? Excellent question. I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, uh, so we've, uh, we've, there's been on the order of 30 patients now that have received the Amy amputation. Um, largely that, that surgical work has been done by Brigham Women's Hospital led by Dr. Matthew Carty. Um, now Walter Reed um, is now becoming engaged in conducting these surgeries as well. Thus far, largely, uh, the soft tissue surgical work has been covered by insurance. So we're hopeful that we can rapidly translate the Amy uh, amputation technique uh, to many communities uh, of the world. In terms of really uh, exploiting uh, the full capability in terms of neural prosthetic control that the Amy offers, um, there's a lot of work there to be done. We the magnet tracking, for example, we have to do a first in human clinical trial and it has to be commercialized and so on. But even without these future uh, artificial neural interfaces, the soft tissue Amy work itself has tremendous value. As I stated in our recent paper, we, we see a reduction in pain. We see an increase in phantom range of motion. I mentioned um, in my last slides, uh, a, a central remodeling where, where there's a greater embodiment and so on and so forth. So even, um, even now the Amy has tremendous advantages. And fortunately uh, there's reimbursement now um, to, to, to uh, apply the Amy uh, in many hospitals. Um, the challenge, one challenge is training. Um, uh, I know Matthew Cardi and the other surgeons involved um, would, would love to uh, train their colleagues throughout the world on this procedure. So we're, we're beginning to that important work. Fantastic. 
So this is NIH does a lot of MRIs. So this question comes up about concerns about the magnetic beads for things like context of MRIs and of course going through the gates at the you know the airport and things like that that people worry about. Right. Um, we we're uh, gearing up to to answer that question. Um, uh, our initial initial modeling uh, says that a, a fairly modest uh, field such as a three T machine uh, shouldn't be an issue, um, but we're we're now gearing up to conduct those experiments. Okay. Um, one question about the minimal distance from the knee to allow some of these prostheses. I guess they're talking about the the ones below the knee. Right. Yeah. The build height of the uh, the transtibial prosthesis is, is very important. Um, uh, and as robotic technology gets better and better, that, that, that stack or build height of the foot ankle prosthesis will get lower and lower. That'll allow the residuum to get longer and longer, which makes the Amy function functionality even better because the more we can preserve natural fascicle length and fascicle strains, um, the, the, the greater will be the proprioception feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in time, we'll have smaller robots and, and longer residuums. So this question is coming basically as a comment saying how amazing it is that, to, to give these sensation to these limbs. But you know that sort of brings up the question, you know, what can be done if you already have an amputation now? How much of this is possible for those people? Absolutely. So we, uh, Matthew Cardi and, and I and others now have funding um, from CDMRP uh, and we're conducting a clinical trial where um, we have a cohort of persons that already have an amputation, such as myself, that US Civil War era type amputation. And as a revision procedure, we're showing that we can create these Amy constructs um, uh, without having uh, to do it in elective surgery. So um, where we sit now is we believe that persons with a new amputation as well as persons um, that already have uh, an amputation can receive these Amy constructs. That's great. Um, let me see if there's anything more here. A lot of just, you know, wonderful comments, wonderful work, amazing, which Oh, thank you. I'm sure you'll hear. Um, make sure. I think I think I've covered them all. There's no more comments. Well, that's um, perfect. We only have. Uh, we're, we're almost at three o'clock. <laughs> that's very good timing. Um, I have to repeat the CME code, which is three one three zero seven. For those who came late, again, you know, it's been such an honor to have you here at NIH. You know, we've learned so much, and, and more than that, we've been inspired to really go out there and, and try to do more. I mean, it's just, your work has been incredible, continues to be incredible. There's always new amazing stuff and we, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Um, we all appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me and, and thank you uh, to all the folks in the audience. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs>